The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. We like to start every Thursday morning with something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one hysterical acronym at a time, and we try to figure out what, I'm sorry, what did you say? What does that have to do with my life? How is that going to save me from anything uh, except hysteria and running out into the street with my hair on fire? And so how we tackle this is we take the, the phrase or whatever it is, and we give you an actual definition, mostly so we can make fun of it. And then we give you a working definition, something that hopefully you can sink your teeth into. If you don't get it the first time, that's okay. Eventually we repeat them. And, and the whole thing is to make progress, right? Not to get it all solved in one day. All right, so today's jargon term, my friends, mass trial. Now, doesn't this sound like something uh, that you'd see on a TV show that's on late at night uh, where we're going to put a whole bunch of people on trial? Well, when we're talking about autism, that's not what we're talking about. We're not going to call judges. Nobody is going to actually be indicted. That's not what's happening. So let's take a look at what our actual definition for mass trial is. A mass trial is a repeated consecutive trials of the same SD and target. Everybody sing with me. It's all straight now, right? <laughs> we don't have to do anything more because that makes total sense to me. And listen, if you've got a child, whether, whether you're a parent, a teacher, uh, or a relative and you've got a, 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 you're dealing with somebody who's going to get ABA therapy and you're talking to a behavior expert, uh, they will use this word, well, let's mass trial it. Well, let's mass trial it. And then you finally work up the energy to say, and, and the humility to say, I'm sorry, you've been saying that word, that phrase over and over and over again. What exactly does that mean? And then this is what they say. Oh, it's repeated consecutive trials of the same SD and target. And you go, okay. <laughs> you know, really. Okay, so let's give you the, uh, the working definition here of mass trial. Mass trial is getting your, de your child to demonstrate exactly the same target behavior. So, um, and this, this is something used in ABA, um, specifically in the portion of ABA that we refer to as DTT. I know, more jargon. Uh, okay, we're not even gonna, I'm not even gonna fill your head with nonsense to talk about what DT stands for, right? Because you don't need to know that today. But we wanna teach something to somebody and we wanna make sure that they learn it. And by the way, we do this in lots of different ways, but I'm gonna show you the way that you're gonna see it most often because it looks really bizarre. Um, so we have something that we wanna teach the person um, and we want them to learn it. So let's say that I'm going to teach them pen, right? Um, I want them to learn pen and I want them to learn pen in all different kinds of way. I want them to learn so that when I say, what is it? They say, it's a pen. I want them uh, to learn when I say, give me the pen, that they hand me the pen, right? That they know what it is. Um, I, I want them, um, there's many things, but let's just start with those because those are the expressive and the receptive goals. So that if I say, what is it? You can either vocally or through sign or through pointing to a picture or text that you can say it's a pen. Um, and that when I say, give me the pen, you understand that what I'm talking about is this. So one direction you're saying it, one direction you're hearing and understanding what it is. Um, but if I've got a bunch of things on the desk and I'm saying, give me the pen, they're never going to learn what the pen is. So uh, we're going to teach just pen. 
Um, and so I'm, I'm, this is my S, uh, my SD, uh, let's say that I'm going to do the give me the pen. Uh, so my SD is give me the pen. That's the thing I say or do to get you to do the thing that I want you to do. And the target is that I want you to pick up the pen and give it to me. Okay. So I say, give me the, uh, give pen. Cause you want to make it as few letters as possible in the, in the beginning, few words as possible, give pen. And so the child, you know, and I may have to, in the beginning, physically prompt because they don't know what a pen is, right? Got to start from somewhere, right? And so I say, uh, give pen. And, and I take the child's hand and I very gently, you know, help them. I hand over hand, you know, take it. And, uh, yay! I give reinforcement um, and something more meaningful than just praise, right? And I just do that. Eventually, um, I may put in distractors, right? So I've, I've taught pen and eventually I may put in other things. So I may put in paper and I may put in cup, right? But I'm not teaching those. I'm not even going to talk about what those are. I say, uh, give pen and the child gives me the pen. Yay. And now I change the order of them, right? Give pen. I'm only teaching pen. That's a mass trial. Later on, I'm going to now mass trial something else. Maybe I want to teach cup next. I wouldn't, but <laughs> let's say that I was. So I'm going to teach cup now. I don't have the pen involved in this. I just teach cup, give cup. And the child gives me the cup. Yay. Fabulous. And I put in distractors. I'm not going to put the pen as, in as a distractor. I put in the paper and I put in the phone and I say, give cup right? They give me the cup. Yay. I'm only teaching cup. That's what a mass trial is. It looks ridiculous. I'm just going to be honest with you. They, they, you know, teach your child something and they put thing, give cup and you go, they're not really learning what cup is because you're not teaching anything else. Right. But what we're doing is creating a habit of, I say certain things, you do certain things, you get reinforcement. It isn't until later on when we go into something called random rotation where I'm going to put the pen back in and I'm going to randomly rotate it with another thing that we've learned, maybe cup, because now I'm going to see can the child figure out when I say give pen that I'm not talking about the cup. And there's going to be a period of time where the child is confused about that. I'll say give pen. And the child might go for the cup and I'm not going to go, no, I'm just going to take their hand and, and lead it over and, and go, good job. You gave me the pen because what happens is the child's ear starts to, if the reward is big enough, tune to, okay, this pen you speak of is this thing. And this cup you speak of is this thing. It works, looks stupid, but it works. Um, so when people talk about mass trialing something, that means they're going to isolate it and repeatedly teach it until the child can do it. And then eventually they're going to randomly rotate it. So mass trial is teaching one thing over and over and over again so that the child, it really is like tuning the ear to it. And it's, I don't, you know, I don't pretend to know all the, the fine nuances of it, but Here's what I do know. It works. I can't tell you how many times they sat in my dining room and did that with my son. And I thought, oh my goodness, they must be out of their minds. We're never going to get there. That like, and you see the videotapes of it and you think, oh, you poor people, you're delusioned and you don't know what you, it works. Ladies and gentlemen, it works and it works relatively really quickly within a couple of days. If it's done well, children start to discriminate between two. And, and I talk about this all the time on the show. Think about Helen Keller and how hard it was in the beginning for Annie Sullivan to teach her water. It just took forever, right? And Annie Sullivan was ready to throw in the towel and like, ugh, I'm, she's, she's deaf and she's blind. I'm signing into her hand. She has no idea. But she taught her water and suddenly she got it, right? And there's, you can watch movies and they have that moment where she gets it. And very quickly she takes her over and all she was teaching was water. You know, she was trying other things too, but she was really focused on water. She takes her over and she signs doll. And as soon as 
Helen understands, oh, this means water and this means doll. It was like, oh, I got the code. I now understand that to you, if I want to communicate with you, these symbols mean water, these sy symbols mean doll, and then she just wanted to learn everything. And honestly, I've seen that, that happen with my child. I've seen that ha happen with other children. They're like, oh, you've been and it all has been, made no sense. But once they get a couple of them, they just start going like a sponge learning everything. It's very, very exciting. So mass trial. Now you know what it is. Um, and feel free to ask questions of your ABA team and have them give the finer points of it, but you, at least you, you got a place to start with, right? Okay, we always have a question of the day for you. Um, and our question today, I mentioned before that it's been 11 years. Just last week we commemorated that it had been 11 years since my son had been diagnosed with autism. And when I think about the 11 years, oh, you know, I get so emotional to think about how far we have come. And if somebody could have sat me down on that first day and given me assurances about what was going to happen, I don't think I would have heard it. I don't think I would have, but I pose this question to you. What's the one thing you wish someone had told you 10 years ago? And there was one thing that somebody said to me when we were about mm, three years in that really super duper resonated with me. And it wasn't to do with autism. Uh, it was to do with something else. And somebody said, what, uh, and I want to get this right because I often mess it up, but they said, if I told you that you would be successful, right, uh, at, at something, whatever it is that you really want. And what I translated it to was helping my child to navigate autism. So to me, that was successful. That didn't necessarily mean a specific end point, but helping my child to navigate autism, which further, if we pared it down for me, was like, let's take away as much of the disabling. There were many benefits to autism, and I could see that fairly early on, but there were disabling aspects to it. If I could remove those and amp everything else, to me, that was successful. Um, so they, the person said, if I could say to you, you, I can guarantee you that you will be successful if you work really hard for the next two years. And I mean really, really hard. I guarantee you, you will be successful. Uh, how hard would you work? If I guaranteed you that you would be successful if you worked really hard for two years, how hard would you work? And I spent a lot of time thinking about that because the answer to it that they then gave me was, well, that's how hard you have to work to be successful. That's the secret sauce. And I really took that to heart. Now, I, as a family, we worked as hard as we could. Did that mean that we were always 100% working hard? No, because you can't. <laughs> right? But that we, on a, on a frequent basis, did enough of the right things and made ourselves do enough of the right things that I feel like we have been successful. We continue to grow, but I, I feel like we were successful at helping our child to navigate autism. Uh, have I been able to apply that to other things in my life? You know, not really. <laughs> Not really, uh, you know, dribs and drabs here and there that I go, oh, I need to apply that to the, but it was uh, so important to me with autism and it came at a moment when I was asking a question. Uh, so that's what I have to share with you today. If I could guarantee you that you could be successful, how hard would you work? That's how hard you have to work. There's never any guarantees, but when we work really hard, it's funny, I, I know somebody who has a pillow who says, that says, the harder I worked, the luckier I got. I believe that. There is hard work to be done. There are things that you can do that help to ensure that you will be successful. And successful means a lot of things to a lot of people. So I offer that up to you, but we'd love to hear from you. Write in on our Facebook and tell us what you wish somebody had said to you 10 years ago. All right, uh, we also always have a topic for the week. 
And this is going to seem strange, but it goes hand in hand with what we were talking about. Our topic this week is acceptance versus contentment. Everybody take a deep breath, right? They're different. And we always confuse them because we're human beings. But there is a difference between accepting what is and being content with it. Um, there are lots of different ways that this can apply to your life today. But there might be something that's kicking your keister that you just, ugh, it's hard. It could be uh, that your child has been diagnosed and this is not what you thought you signed up for. It could be that you have lost a therapist from your team and you just, like, you just don't want that to be the case. It could be that the school district is giving you a hard time. It could be that your child didn't get into the school that you wanted to go into. It could be that you're not happy with things that are happening politically. It, like, it could be you're not happy with how your significant other is dealing with something, right? Um, and your feelings of unhappiness and your rejection of wanting to look at it, they're valid. They're just, they're just valid, right? And we, we're not trying to say, well, get over it, because I don't know anybody that that ever worked for, right? But there is power in saying to yourself, okay, that is what is. What is within my power? We always whittle this down to, there's something called the serenity prayer. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And see, for me, I think that wisdom to know the difference is what's the difference between acceptance and contentment. There will always be a phase in your life when your child has been diagnosed when it does not feel like that could possibly be your life. I know that firsthand when you go, no, I don't, like, no, I had a child. My child doesn't have autism. My child's not autistic. My child, you know, isn't what I'm hearing, right? I think that's really, really common and all of us go through that phase. But I will tell you that I think that a day comes when you go, okay, now what do I have to do about it? And that's when you accept and you get into a place where you say, but I'm not content. And it's really important for your mental health, and we're going to talk a little bit about mindfulness later, about getting to that place. Um, because while we are railing and not in acceptance, we're not fully participating in what we can do to change. I always, when I'm talking to somebody and, or myself, because I get there stuck there too, I always bring up, you, you know, Dr. Phil, how Dr. Phil came into being and being who, the fact that he's Dr. Phil and we all know who Dr. Phil is because Oprah was being sued by the Texas cattlemen um, and everybody had said to her, oh, nothing is going to happen with this. It's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to, and suddenly she found herself having to move her entire show, her entire staff and go for over a month and be in Texas and be on trial, disrupting her show and her livelihood and everything because she had said something on her show. And, and she was sitting in a hotel room every night going, how could this have happened? This isn't like, this isn't, this shouldn't be, this can't be. This is crazy. How could this happen? And they were losing. They were losing the court case. And so they hired, they said, we need a psychologist to come in here and get her in the moment. <laughs> and, and so somebody said, I got this guy, Phil McGraw, let's bring him in here. And Dr. Phil came in and said, you know, okay, sometime later we can talk about how unfair this is, but you need to get with the program. This is happening. And if you don't accept that it's happening and start to deal with it, you're going to be in a whole lot more hurt. And he got her to snap out of it. And she said, whoa, you're right. I, she was stuck. And she said, you're good. <laughs> you got to write a book. You got you to gotta do a show. You got to come on my show. Um, and that's how Dr. Phil came into being because he got Oprah to accept. You're on trial in Texas. Now, you're not content with that, so let's do something about it, but stop sitting and arguing about that. Get, get, your head into, uh, get your head around the fact that this is what's going on. 
we can all learn from that. Acceptance versus contentment. You never, ever, ever have to be content. And that's okay. And you can still be in peace and not be content with what's happening. But if you are not in agreement with what's happening, you will never find peace. So acceptance versus contentment. We're going to talk about it more in our mindful. That's actually going to come up fairly soon. So some of the things that we got going on the show today, oh my gosh, cornucopia guests. In just a few minutes, we taped an interview yesterday, so you'll see me in different clothing. But do you, uh, those of you who watched the show for a while, we used to have Angela Persicky on every Thursday, and then she got really busy. But we were able to bring her back yesterday, and uh, she's talking about a very special event that's happening on February 2nd. It's a parent workshop. So that's coming up in just a few minutes. A little bit later on this hour, special education attorney Bonnie Yates is going to be with us for legal matters, answering your questions. And then in the next hour, we have, uh, excuse me, the amazing uh, Pastor Lamar Hardwick is going to be with us. You've seen him in lots of different places, most especially on The Mighty. He is a fabulous gentleman who was diagnosed very late in life at the age of 35. He was a pastor, married, had children, but things in his life weren't working. They just weren't jiving and he couldn't figure out what was going on. Went and was seen and was diagnosed. And his take on things as a dad, as a pastor, as a husband, uh, it's just so illuminating. Uh, so he's written a book and he's here with us today to talk about his new book. So that'll be really fun. And then we're going to squeeze in one more guest that we confirmed late last night. Carrie Bowers from The Art of Autism is going to be with us. She's bringing a very special guest, Brian. And Brian, I just don't have his name with me, but I will get it before the next segment. Um, Brian is a, uh, a gentleman who is on the autism spectrum. This is only going to be his second interview. He is being featured at an event that Carrie is also doing on February 2nd. So we're promoting two different events locally here in Los Angeles on February 2nd. You have to pick which one you want to go to. But so uh, the Art of Autism is doing an all autism panel. People, a whole panel of people who are on the autism spectrum are going to be there talking on a lot of different topics, answering questions from people in the audience. It's a really uplifting event. Brian is going to be one of the adults on the spectrum on the panel. He is going to be here with Carrie talking with us. That's towards the end of the show. All of that and ever so much more coming up. We're going to take a short break. And then when we come back, uh, we are going to show you the interview with Angela Persicky that we did yesterday. Stick with us. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm so excited because we have one of our old friends with us here in the studio. For those of you who've been watching the show for a while, she used to be a regular on the show, and then she just got too busy uh, because she's out changing the world and doing all kinds of things. And, and Samantha just showed you, so those of you who know, it's Angela Persicky. And she is the clinical manager now for the entire Ventura County area, mm -hmm. uh, changing lives, doing all kinds of things. She's just an amazing young woman uh, working in this field of ABA and thrilled to have her back with us to talk about something very specific. So first of all, welcome back. 
Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. We miss you. I know. I miss coming here. <laughs> I know. Um, but, you know, we always say on the show, we, we have experts who are on the show when they can be here. And we know that you're out there in the field working and that that's why you can't be with us on a more regular basis. So it's one of those things, yes. you know, where we just go, all right, we know she's doing good someplace <laughs> else. Um, but it is a thrill to have you back. And we... Last week on the show, we ha we called it the Dana and Dina show. Uh, we had uh, the two of the amazing ladies from We Rock the Spectrum who were with us. Dana Agassi, who is the owner of the We Rock the Spectrum in Agora Hills, and Dina Kimmel, who is the CEO of We Rock the Spectrum around the world. And they were talking about an amazing event that they have coming up, and we promised that we would have you on to talk about it as well. You've got a workshop that's coming up at the We Rock the Spectrum in Agora Hills. So tell us a little bit about the workshop. Definitely. We are so excited for this workshop and to partner with We, we Rock the Spectrum. They are a great resource for families in the community. Um, if you don't know too much about them and you didn't see the show last week, We Rock the Spectrum provides um, kids' gyms for um, individuals, um, children. And, of all abilities, uh, yeah, really. Yeah, all abilities. And uh, it's a great place, so much fun. We yeah. love going there with our kids, our yes. clients too. Uh, and uh, they are right down the street from our main Thousand Oaks office. And so we are partnering with them to provide a, an event for families in the community, a workshop focused on um, understanding your child's needs. Okay. And uh, so we are going to be talking more about autism, autism spectrum disorders, uh, some of the early signs and symptoms, how to identify it, and then also um, discussing with parents what we do at CARD. Uh, the types of services that we provide as well as um, understanding their child's behavior. Yeah. And so we're going to um, give a few mini workshop talks on um, these various topics and then um, Dana will be there to share her story as well and um, inform the community as far as what We Rock the Spectrum will provide too. I know they do a lot of camps and various events as well. It's really a wonderful thing. I, you know, we, we still, we think, you know, all these years later that all the information is out there and we forget. I remember what it was like on the first day, um, uh, how many questions you have and how you need to find your community. And you got to know, you know, where can you go to feel safe while you're working through and what you have to mm -hmm. work through, right? And so this type of an event is really lovely. Mm -hmm. um, for And, and I'm, I'm going to ask you what you think. Like, who are the ideal people to come to this event? Is it people who are thinking about getting diagnosed? Are they just gotten diagnosed? Have they been in this for a little while? Or is it all of them? I think uh, it's, it's definitely open to all families because we are um, going to be describing the various services we offer. And we offer a wide variety of services, yeah. anywhere from early intensive behavior therapy to adult services um, and um, adaptive living skills to social skills groups. Yes. And, uh, so we're going to be discussing that, but, um, you know, then having the We Rock the Spectrum there to talk about what they can offer too. So those are the families who already are um, getting ABA services are already connected in the community. They are welcome as well. Okay. Um, but if you uh, are a parent who uh, is starting to um, notice some, some symptoms or some signs that may be related to autism or you're curious about um, what is out there to support your family and maybe you are getting um, some ABA services or maybe your school is providing some support but you feel that you need more and your child needs more, um, you are the perfect parent to attend this workshop. Okay, now it's happening on February 2nd, mm -hmm. and it's in the evening. It's from 6 to 8, but mm -hmm. dinner is being provided. Yes. BJ's is providing dinner. Yep. So you're going to come, you're going to eat, you're going to get time with mm -hmm. experts and with other family members. But here's my favorite part, is that they're offering child care. Now, if you want child care, which to me is like the key linchpin mm -hmm. to this, because so often, you know, you don't have somebody that you can leave your child with and you're worried. So if you need child care, you've got to call in advance. Um, so call Dana um, at We Rock at 818-991-5437. Again, that's 818-991-5437. You will need to call Dana to RSVP 
Um, and uh, anyway, so call her, but then let her know if you need the child care because it's not the kind of thing that you can just show up and say, oh, now I need the child care. Nobody would want that child, kind of child care, right? You want to make sure that, um, that you've got the right amount of people who have the right know-how, right? And the only mm -hmm. way you're going to get that is if you write in advance. And uh, Samantha's showing a picture of one of the many We Rock the Spectrums right there. They're really incredible, colorful places where kids get to be kids. Yep. And there are, it's, it's with a mind to the sensory situations that we need to have for kiddos who are on the spectrum, which happens to be great for everyone. We were saying last week on the show that when Wyatt was turning 13, mm -hmm. Nancy's son Wyatt, she, uh, you know, last minute, and her husband was very sick, and she said, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to have a birthday party. And I said, are you kidding me? There's a yep. We Rock the Spectrum <laughs> down the street from you. It just happened to be this one where they're going to have this event. And so they had the birthday party there. My son was there. I would say at least half the birthday party was girls that Wyatt went to school with that were 13 years old, not on the spectrum. Uh, and everybody had a blast. Oh, yeah. Always. Everybody was on the zip line, going yep. into the crash pit, mm -hmm. climbing up the, the ropes, on the, the swing. I, it was such a good time. I just wish there was a place like that when I was little. <laughs> right? But I love the fact that the zip lines, I don't know if this is the, the case in all of them, but their the weight on them is something like 400 pounds, so we can ride on them too. <laughs> uh, we really, really love that. So uh, again, the event is meant for information. Yes. Mm -hmm. And 6 to 8, February 2nd, mm -hmm. you're going to be there? I will be there. Make sure that you RSVP. You yeah. will get an opportunity to meet Angela. Thank you so much for being with us. Anytime. You will come back whenever you're around. I will. All right, you're here, to, here first, and we will be back after these messages. What is autism? 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 Uh, <laughs> I've been asking myself that for a very, very long time. Um, let me think about that one. <laughs> um, trying to, uh, just, uh... Um... Jeez, let me think. <laughs> oh man, that's a big one, yes. Uh, autism, uh, uh... Autism is a neurological disorder that affects many of our kids in different ways. It's a learning disability that affects the cognitive functions of the brain. A lot of people have the misconception that it's a disability and it's really not. I look at it as like a special gift. When one person thinks differently from another. It's an opportunity for everyone to learn to understand someone that's a little different than them. Autism is the ability to educate. They're given so much talent in different areas. To me, autism means a chance to be with and be around people you really care about. Autism is beautiful. It's a way of seeing the world differently. It's always unique, totally intelligent, and sometimes mysterious. Happiness that, that, that comes out of my um, son's um, hard work. It's a movement. Unpredictable. That's, That's right. right. Awesome. Love. The field I want to work in. Laughter. Fun. Joy. Autism is beautiful to me. I want you to remember these three words. There is hope. This makes me cry. The, the one woman who uh, who says laughter and joy and she was trying so hard not to cry and we were hugging afterwards that day. I love that video. Uh, and that was taken at Fullerton Cares Mardi Gras for Autism which is coming up on April 1st this year. We will be there. You will want to be there too. It's a good time. Uh, okay, we wanted to get to our mindfulness moment really quickly though, and I apologize, Samantha, I just want to backtrack for a second and say uh, to those of you who are writing in on Facebook, we, I love it, Courtney, hey, hey girl, uh, and to Erica who loves, yes, si se puede, uh, we, we're all about that here, and because we can. Uh, and Laura Quinn, I'm so glad that you're watching and I, I, uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you soon. Okay. Uh, and it, now it's time for the mindfulness moment. So our mindfulness, we, every Thursday now, we started this last year, we'd like to take just a minute on Thursday to remind ourselves, myself included, how important it is to take a mindfulness break. That mindfulness, we've, we know the studies are rapidly pouring in showing that, first of all, Everybody in the autism community is under more stress than the average so-and-so, right? Than the average bear. And that um, 
if we participate in mindfulness activities that we can lower that stress and you know when we lower stress we get more done so you know how much more important could it be um, and so lots of different ways because we can all appreciate uh, mindfulness in different ways uh, so we're exploring little things so my, my tip for today is to Instagram mentally Instagram a moment sometimes we get so caught up in our heads and I'm a big believer in that creative part of your brain where you get lost in time and space and you know that in some ways that's a little vacation too but it's not a mindful vacation it's creative vacation and we want to take mindful vacation something where we are fully present in the moment and I am somebody I get Facebook totally understand Facebook and I'm all about Facebook right the Twitter thing not so much my home territory and the Instagram haven't helped me I <laughs> I'm just lost and so many of you writing go why are you guys not doing more stuff on Instagram because Shannon doesn't get it Shannon doesn't really get it and I had said to somebody a couple weeks ago um, you know, I don't really get the Instagram thing. I don't understand why. And they were saying, oh, but I would think you're very visual. I would think you would really be into this because it's about, and this was their explanation of it, and maybe you won't agree with it, but I thought, oh, this is, we should do this with mindfulness. They were saying it's about taking just a moment in time and encapsulating it and sharing just a moment. So, you know, Twitter, you get a certain number of characters. Facebook, you, you can put a picture, you can put a video, whatever. But Instagram, it's a picture, and yes, you can put a saying, and you can do different things to it, but it's about capturing a moment. Um, a moment in time, and then others can comment on it. And I was thinking, oh, well, you know, that's mindfulness. We need to capture this moment here in time. And so there is a way that you can mentally take a photograph. Um, I, I was saying the other day when I was at the Women's March with my son that I, there was a moment when I was so overwhelmed with a, a good feeling, you know? And those don't come <laughs> every day, unfortunately. But I was there with my son and I felt so well. Um, and that is not my normal go-to in that many people. But I said to my son, we were locked in arms, and I said, Let's just stop for just a second, look around, take it in. What do you see? What do you smell? What do you feel? What do you notice? Like, because we will remember this for the rest of our lives. And it's true that, you know, there, there are those little snapshots that you remember from time, that you don't remember the whole of an event, but you remember a snapshot. And usually there's like a sensory component that goes with it and you remember what you were feeling and you can, if you bring that picture back up in your head, man, you can be right there again. So why not fill your brain with good things? And sometimes it's not the most exciting thing, right? Sometimes it's like the most mundane thing that I can think of a chair that my mother had in her dining room. And, I, and if I think hard enough of what that chair looked like, I can feel what the fabric felt like, the tweed felt like in my fingers. And it brings back a memory of when I was a child, right? And it's a pretty mundane thing. So we can do this in the present moment. We can take a three second, 30 second break at any point and Instagram emotionally and mentally the moment for ourselves because we will never be here again in this moment and we you know we may do something over and over and over and over again but there comes a time when it's the last time right my husband and i were just talking about that the other day that i can remember holding my son on my hip and it felt like we did that forever because we did for years but then there came a day when it was the last time and now it'd be ridiculous for me to i would topple over uh, he's five inches taller than me, right? <laughs> we, couldn't, we couldn't do that. But, you know, I can remember Instagramming moments, not knowing that that's what it was, when I would go to put him in the car seat. I would take him out of, like, the shopping cart and hold him because that would be the moment that he wouldn't, you know, squiggle. And I would hold him and smell his little head and, and be in the parking lot and just breathe for a moment before I put him into his five-point harness, Right. Ooh, those are, those are good, powerful things. But how much more powerful to do it in this moment? And you get that little break for just a moment of, okay, in this moment, 
yeah, I got that I got to deal with. I don't know how I'm going to fix that. I don't know what I'm going to do about this. But in this moment, the truth is everything's okay right now. And that gives you the energy and the courage to be able to face whatever that thing is that happened yesterday, the thing that's going to happen tomorrow, right? Instagram a moment just for yourself. Uh, take that breath. And, uh, and be mindful. It'll help with the stress, I guarantee you. All right, uh, we gotta take a break because it's time for Legal Matters with Bonnie Yates. And we were gonna be talking about Diploma Track, but Bonnie messaged me this morning and we have got to talk about a bullying case. So don't go anywhere, stick with us. Um, being part of this community is really important to a mom um, with a son like Jackson because it really does take a village and you need so much support, you know, to, um, to help bring out all of the amazing qualities and um, skills and talents that our children have. So I'm, I'm just very grateful to everybody who was a part of this. I think it helps with all sorts of that uh, self-esteem, social skills. They seem to communicate a little bit with each other and they had a lot of friends. Um, the helpers were phenomenal and I think the social skills for sure because they, you know, they worked together and they did a couple of group things across the floor and they sang songs together and I, I yeah, for sure, I think it's a really huge deal. A great program. What programs like this show is the person is in front of what we call today a disorder. I think what we're finding is that uh, these sorts of brain challenges that make people unique can actually be gifts in, in ways we haven't discovered in the rest of society to, to bring them out. So when you see a program like this and you see the kids dancing, having fun, and making up jokes, making up the story, I was here when they did that. That was so amazing to watch because they were all focused, they were all present, and they were all laughing, they were all getting into the creation of this story. And um, that to me sort of broke the barrier to say, now well, first we're dealing with people and, and then we're dealing with the challenges. Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm so thrilled and excited and privileged that I get to say to you that it's time to do legal matters with special education attorney Bonnie Yates. She is joining us right now via Skype and we are so grateful to have you with us, Bonnie. Good morning and uh, please tell our audience what law firm you are with. Sure, thank you. I'm a senior attorney at Hugh and Chow LLP in Culver City. Wonderful. And uh, we, we always have a special disclaimer at the start of the show that we like to give people about the fact that in this format, they can't mistake advice for, so I'll let you do that. <laughs> yeah, so we're in California. The lawyers that you talk to here are usually licensed in California. I am. I used to be in Texas. I'm not anymore. It had nothing to do with bad behavior. It was just too far away. Um, I'm also licensed to practice before the federal courts in all the, the 50 states. So any advice I give is A, of a general nature, your specific problem should require specific consultation with an attorney, and B, I'm advising you based on California and or federal law, and I will try to tell you when it's either or, but the law may be different in your state. Okay, and everybody needs to be aware of that. And also, Bonnie and I were just talking briefly before we went live on the air, and she was saying, would your, you know, Shannon, would you like to ask your viewers if they would be interested in an IEP prep show where we talk about what 
an attorney does to prep someone for an IEP. And I said, we can absolutely ask them, Bonnie, but I know what the answer will be, uh, that the answer will be a resounding yes. That you. So I'm thrilled, Bonnie, that you want to do that, and that'll be coming up in future shows. Now, I had said yesterday that we were going to be talking specifically about Diploma Track, and, and, but we're going to save that because you had something come up and there's a bullying case that we want to talk specifically about, right? Right. So there were three questions and they were all excellent. The first question was pros and cons of Diploma Track, which parents I'm working with are definitely dealing with on both sides of the, of the question. And then there was another question about accommodations, which is a fantastic question and worthy of, of a whole show. So we're going to do a whole show on uh, grade school and uh, primary accommodations through high school and then accommodations for college if you need to take SAT type tests to get into college and then what you can have at the college level itself. So we're going to hit accommodations hard. Um, and today, because I'm spoiling myself, I got interested in the bullying question and it went in, in an interesting direction. The question was, um, my son still has a zero tolerance for bullying policy, yet every time we have something happen, they tell us it's not really bullying. According to who? My son thinks it's bullying. Now, we don't know how old this person is or anything about his particular eligibility or background. My son thinks it's bullying. I think it's bullying. Is there a definition of bullying that the schools are going by? School is saying it's just kids being kids, and they will talk to them frustrated. Well, listen, um, frustrated, from hearing your question, I get the feeling that you're in a small district that isn't keeping up with the times, because it's very easy to have a bullying problem on campus these days, and I don't think kids will be kids or boys will be boys is going to cut it. So let's talk about um, bullying generally, bullying under California law, and, um, you know, what kind of remedies people have. In, in California, it turns out, thank you readers for directing me to, or listeners for directing me to this, um, there is a specific definition of bullying under the education code. Um, and so your school is always gonna be bound by that policy um, or that law, excuse me, and then each district will have its own, uh, or should have its own board policy that you can go online and, and get. And I'm holding up Culver Cities um, my son was bullied all through middle school and high school in Culver City. I didn't have a clue as to what to do about it, mostly because it was occurring outside of school, after school, but it was occurring in front of me. And um, the worst it got was some kid filled up a squirt gun with urine and actually squirted him with it. So oh. it was pretty egregious. It was, yeah, yeah, boys will be boys, kids will be kids. It was pretty egregious bullying, and, and you know, when he got out of there, he never looked back. And I wish I'd done a better job and been more informed. But um, so what I, I found is that, first of all, the, the Culver City definition of bullying in their board policy is, is very, very similar to the education code. And the way I found this out is I printed out the Culver City board policy. And then I went and read an, a, an interesting decision that I'm going to talk to you about, um, which is a bullying case that I think the end result might surprise you. Um, but anyway, um, Education Code uh, Section 48900 says, bullying is not defined within the IDEA, I meaning it's not defined in federal law. Bullying is defined under the California Education Code for purposes of finding grounds for suspension or expulsion of a student as, quote, any severe or pervasive physical or verbal act or conduct by a pupil or a group of pupils, including one or more acts committed by a pupil or group of pupils as defined in section 48900.2, etc., directed toward one or more pupils that has or can be reasonably predicted to have the effect of one or more of the following. So this is, this is what you have to be able to show. A fear of harm to your person or property, a substantially de or a substantially detrimental effect on her physical or mental health, a substantial interference with her academic performance, or a substantial interference with her ability to participate in or benefit from the services, activities, or privileges provided by a school. So this decision, uh, Parent versus Los Angeles Unified School District, OAH case number 20150507.10, and if you remember the goodie, 
you can go look it up and read it if you want to. Um, so this, this case was written by a very liberal administrative law judge who I don't want to, you know, I don't want to tarnish his reputation by saying this on the air, but he's got a very good reputation with parents. And so you would think in this case everything would line up correctly to show that the bullying constituted a denial of a free, appropriate public education, which is one way that bullying is litigated. The other is um, kind of more of a civil rights issue. So um, this student, and, and this case, I think, kind of exemplifies a lot of the problems that you have, because a lot of the time, the bully, the bully was bullied and becomes the bullier. And, and sometimes it's very hard to deal with this from a disciplinary standpoint because children who are bullying, who have IEPs, are protected by IDEA, and it's difficult to expel them if their behavior is a manifestation of their disability, as you will see in this case. So um, I'm really just going to kind of like brief you on this case, and I think you'll see um, why we're talking about it. So the student was a five-year-old. Okay, so he was in kindergarten, and he was eligible under autism. And um, his mom was concerned about, you know, his communication abilities, ability to read social cues and safety awareness, and she had him in a transitional kindergarten uh, in Hancock Park. There was another student in his classroom, and, and that child was also eligible for uh, special education under autism, but his classmate was more severely impacted by his disability than the student was. So the, the, the less, uh, the more severe student began um, bullying uh, the less severe student, and there were all kinds of problems because um, uh, the, the boys were, were friends. Um, so the classmate, he's referred to as classmate in the decision, was also pulling the hair of other students, biting them, or striking them. Um, and the, the, the two kids, the student and the classmate, were about the same size, um, about the same age, and they socialized. And one day, without provocation, the student was punched in the eye by his classmate. Um, and everybody talked about this. Um, mom was unhappy that they were in the same class, but the district said, well, we're just going to monitor the situation. I'm sure they were concerned that it would be very difficult to move classmate because of stay put. So then a, a week went by, and student is hit in the stomach by classmate during uh, snack time recess, so maybe when there's less supervision. Um, mother tells student to stay away from classmate, um, and uh, other students were told to also reinforce that. But student didn't want to stay away from classmate because he considered classmate to be a friend. So mom at this point requests an IEP meeting, which um, I think didn't happen as soon as it should, which is not a good thing for the district to ignore. Um, they should have had a meeting within 30 days. But anyway, in the meantime, mom kept trying to tell student, you know, stay away from classmate, um, he's going to hurt you, stuff like that. And, and mom sees at this time, and this is not unusual, that now student's behavior starts to change. Um, he starts to tantrum, she feels he's more distant than her. And then in January, there's another incident, student is playing uh, in the yard, student is playing with leaves, like tree leaves in the yard, classmate became upset and hit student in the head. Student was sent to the nurse and given an ice pack, and then everybody met with classmate to try to correct his behavior. So, I mean, classmate was aggressive. You know, he wasn't lightly hitting. He was hitting, you know, hard. So mom, mom sees uh, that when she gets to school at the end of the day, student is not okay. She takes him to the hospital. He basically has a concussion. <sighs> And uh, so finally in February, we get around to the IEP meeting, and mom raises her concerns about bullying, but there's no agreement with the district saying, look, student has a one-to-one -one aid, that should be sufficient, sufficient to protect him. And I mean, one of the things about this is we see students bullied with one-to-one -one aids, and that has something to do with the fact that you can't maintain 100% control over somebody all of the time. But I think it more usually is a product of a lack of skill on the part of the one-on-one -on -one aid, which LAUSD is pretty famous for. Anyway, no agreement at the IEP meeting. 
Um, student is adamant that classmate is his friend and he wants to, um, you know, continue to be friends with him. Um, and then on, on February 9th, classmate hits student over the head with a wooden block. At that point, the teacher decides that classmate is posing too much of a problem and he needs to be removed from the class. He is moved to another class. Um, and mom decides that it doesn't matter to her anymore, and she actually writes the district a letter and asks for a non-public school placement. And there's there's another IEP meeting following this. They don't agree to the new placement. Um, the district says, you know, we don't think classmates really bullying student because he's not demonstrating anger or being mean, and student isn't afraid of him. So you can see little echoes of kind of this... Um, you know, they're just kids being kids, or yeah. he can't help it. Yeah. Anyway, um, you know, so I'm reading the decision saying, well, surely he's going to find that the, that the student was bullied. Um, meantime, student is becoming, student, not classmate, is becoming more aggressive toward other family members, um, is throwing things in the car, and is beginning to exhibit school phobia, which I think is kind of what you start to see. One time, student told mother, I don't want to go to school. Classmate hit me in the head. Um, toward the end of the school year, student became unwilling um, to do homework. Um, so uh, anyway, mom continues in her quest for a private school placement. And um, there, there's a hearing where various teachers and mom testify. And the administrative law judge gives you clues about kind of his his thinking and um you know one of the pros he saw was that the non-public school had a bullying curriculum and i might add parenthetically one thing schools can do that they never do is sensitivity training and not never but not often enough they need to do education about bullying they need to involve other students in the role of being mentors and kind of protectors and zero tolerance for bullying and peers stop bullying when they see it happening but districts don't usually spend the money on that. They're usually reactive. Um, so, the, you know, at the hearing, the district testified that kids in kindergarten do have problems keeping their hands to themselves. They would hit other kids daily. It's part of the curriculum. We work on this. And we think that classmates' problem was that he had no language, so he's expressing himself physically when he's frustrated. Um, and to some extent, they felt that even though his actions were so inappropriate, he was trying to get attention from student. And um, so the teacher said, you know, if this was happening to my child, I would be outraged. But on the other hand, students' uh, academic performance didn't decline over the years, and I don't see any uh, over the school year, and she doesn't see him being anxious in the classroom. So she's basically probably been instructed, I hate to say it, to testify that way by the district. Um, Maybe not. Maybe that's what she really thought. But anyway, student's witness was um, was somebody that uh, came from the non-public school and uh, had a PhD in counseling and psychology. And, and this witness said bullying is generally committed by verbal taunting or harassment, while hitting usually represents aggression, um, which wouldn't necessarily really support uh, parents' view, so I'm not sure why that was a testimony. Anyway, for autistic children, she said, hitting usually arises out of frustration, especially in younger children where the child has a communication deficit. So then the administrative law judge analyzes the facts, relates it to the law, and, and, and gives us a standard for bullying, um, which basically is you know, whether the bullying occurred and whether the bullying resulted in the student not receiving educational benefit within the meaning of IDEA. And he discusses, um, in his view, how the, how the facts apply. And in doing so, there's just a couple interesting things he said. Uh, one was um, that the Office of Civil Rights had published something federally that said the definition of bullying includes a non-exclusive non-exclusive list of specific behaviors that constitutes bullying and constitute bullying and specifies that bullying includes intentional efforts um, to harm one or more individuals. It may be direct or indirect and is not limited to behaviors that cause physical harm and may be verbal. So that's a very broad definition of bullying. 
Anyway, the administrative law judge goes on to look at the other cases that we have that are on point to see how he's going to rule. And he says um, that basically uh, in one case, the parents removed the student from school after only five days. They didn't allow the district to have a reasonable opportunity to address the bullying. So that wasn't a, a denial of faith. Um, if a teacher is deliberately indifferent to the teasing of a disabled child and the abuse is so severe that the child can drive no benefit from the services he or she is offered, that's um, where you'll you'll be able to show that the student has been denied a faith. So it's a very high standard. Deliberate indifference is really a high standard um, as opposed to, let's say, negligence. So then he says, in our case, there were five acts of violence uh, committed by classmate against student during the, the school year. Um, he says that they were both kindergartners and they're still learning. He says classmates more severe degree of autism prevented him from being able to express himself with words. The impact of classmates autism was such that he uh, had to be removed from general ed. He expressed himself by biting, pulling and hitting. Uh, the, the physical acts committed on student meet the definition of bullying in, in California law. Um, and then he says uh, that the bullying, uh, the, one of the things that's important about bullying is you look and you see if there's a power imbalance between the two people. Another is the frequency. And he says there were really only two uh, issues, two incidents in five months. And so it's not really as bad as, as we think it was because classmate was removed from the class. Um, so he's saying that, you know, uh, since there was, I guess, a two month period without an, without an incident, five incidents in six months does not amount to frequent bullying. And, and I was really uh, surprised about this because I thought, you know, that the evidence was very strong. Um, so he talks about how there was also evidence uh, that the student, the classmate, didn't intend to harm the student. That was a factor. And he says district staff didn't ignore the bullying because they removed classmate from the class. Well, they didn't do any bullying education, but okay, they did do something. And student did not suffer educational consequences as a result of the alleged bullying. So there, there's no, there's apparently no denial of fate. So um, anyway. Uh, that's what happened, um, and student was said to have not established his burden of proof beyond by a preponderance of the evidence, which is uh, only a 51% standard. So this family was really being held to a very, very stringent standard, and they were successful in showing that bullying was a denial of faith. Well, this just happened to be the decision that I found. And um, there are, I'm sure, other ones that go the other way. But you can see, if your child is being bullied, you're going to need a very strong record and a strong set of facts uh, in order to make the claim that bullying constituted a denial of educational benefit. So that's, uh, if you want definitions for bullying and, and, and what the rules are in your district, you can either go to the California Special Education Hearing Office database and read some cases. This is just the first one I found. There's probably quite a few under bullying. But you also should pull your board policy and look at it. And then it's going to be your job to convince the IEP team that that the uh, board policy isn't being followed. So that's the best <coughs> advice I can offer today on how to deal with bullying. And to some extent, the problem is, as parents, we're still going to have to be vigilant. We can't assume the school's going to take care of it. You know, I mean, Anyway, that's probably enough about bullying for today. I, you know, it, it overwhelms me, Bonnie, because it, that decision makes me a little bit angry. Um, yeah. Because to say there's only two incidences over five months, well, I was counting three. And, um, and, and when we say zero tolerance for bullying, that means, so if somebody goes to school and punches your kid in the eye, <clears throat> If we go by the strict definition, I mean, it, do, it did say in the first definition that you read, and correct me if I'm wrong, that it could be a single incident, but from what the, the judge was saying in the decision, it sounded like it has to be multiple incidents, and I don't understand why, if it's a zero tolerance, why our kids have to go through something over and over and over again. You know, I'm a, I'm a 
big proponent of inclusion and giving kids an opportunity and clearly something was going on with that other child and he didn't have the means to communicate and I don't mean that that means you know I'm, I'm not a Jeff Sessions fan where I'm like oh that means he needs to be expelled I'm not saying that but clearly that other student needed to be in a more restrictive environment with people who were better trained for everyone's safety because he was acting out um, and maybe he didn't have to be there forever, but you know, to have waited that long to have moved the child, I don't. If, if I was his no. parent, I would be angry. Well, yeah, exactly. This this decision I brought to you, not because it's the best, most pro-parent decision, but because I think it illustrates some of the many contradictions and difficulties that we have in dealing with bullying. Because believe me, if I had been able to go and interview classmates, parents. They would have their own story. Yeah. And when, when, when the school district says there's zero tolerance for bullying, that's not entirely true because a student who has a disability is going to be hard to expel and even hard to move. But I, I mean, this, student, this student's parents, the classmates' parents, could have invoked stay put and kept, it, kept them in the classroom. You know, that didn't happen, but it could have happened. So, you know, I go back to, I'm not a bully apologist for anyone. I think we should have a mandatory curriculum on bullying, civics, and, you know, a few other things that I don't need to go into that would start in kindergarten. But, since, you know, but as we don't, it, it still becomes the response, or it still continues to be the responsibility of the parent to be hypervigilant. And sometimes it's really not clear what to do. I mean, when the kids at... Culver High came up and started bullying my son verbally in, in my face at the end of the school day, I knew it was bad because yeah. they weren't even yeah. afraid to do it in front of me. And I never arrived at a great solution except for graduation, and that's not acceptable. Yeah. You know, it, and Nick has written about his experiences being bullied in high school, and he didn't love it, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I think it's a really tough issue and one that we have to all get educated about, particularly there's like... Hannah Hoovenen at UCLA is a bullying expert, and if districts want to, they can hire her, and she can come in, and she's got a plan for dealing with this. It's not... We'll get her on the show. We will get her on the show. Let's connect with you, because she's fabulous. I would love that. I would love that. Let's get her on the show. Let's, let's get as educated as we can. Bonnie, I thank you so much. You always bring things to light for us. Um, it, there, it's not always what we want to hear, right? No. But it, but it helps us to be prepared for what where we have to fill in the gaps. And and so I really, really appreciate. Um, and we will visit those other topics. Um, we'll start next week with the questions about placement and uh, track, whether it be on right. on the yeah. diploma track. Um, all right, I, I thank you so much. Say the, the name of the law firm for us again and give us that information. Okay, uh, it's Hirji and Chow, LLP, and we're in Culver City, and we can be reached at 310-391-0330. And, you know, I, I wanted it to have a happy ending. I was excited when I found this administrative law judge's decision because he's known to be very fair to parents. So it just shows you it's a tough area. Yes, no, and I'm so glad that you showed us that because then we can see, because we, a lot of parents would walk in and think, hey, this is open and shut. You know, my kid can't be there because of what happened, and and yet that's not the reality. So good, good for us to know. Notice, also notice, Shannon, he did not get the non-public school. Right, that's what I mean. He stayed in public school. He lost the right. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And, uh, okay. And I'm going to call you as soon as the show is completely over. Oh, cool. Okay, All right. I appreciate it. All right. All right. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye-bye. We are going to take, isn't she amazing, you guys? She is just the best. We so appreciate her being with us. Um, we are going to take a short break, and then we are going to be back with Pastor Lamar Hardwick. He is uh, a gentleman. And, and, I, and I say that in all of the, the meetings of gentlemen who he's a pastor and he's a dad, uh, he's a husband, and he was diagnosed with autism at the age of 35. And he's got a story to tell in a new book. So stay tuned. We're going to be right back with him. Hello, fellow activists. In our last segment, we talked about step number two, 
educate yourself. Step number three is get support. Now any journey can feel overwhelming if you feel like you're walking it alone. Well, you're far from alone because with one in 50 kids diagnosed with autism today, there are a lot of us out there. Of course, there's always the issue of financial support. Now there's a handful of organizations out there that offer financial support to families in need. ACT Today, or Autism Care and Treatment Today, is one of them. Visit our website at www.act-today.org to find out more about our grant process. I want to talk about a different kind of support today, emotional support. Now, you can get that from other travelers on this path. Some of the best advice I've ever received is from the moms of other kids with autism who went to school with Wyatt or were involved with programs with him. Then there are the pioneers. These are the families that have gone through this years ago, and there was very little information out there. All of these people seem to have the desire to pay it forward. Now one of them, Lisa Ackerman, who is one of my mentors, started an organization called TACA, Talk About Curing Autism. She actually took the concept of mentors and support groups and made it available to everybody. You can go to their website, talkaboutcuringautism.org, to find out more. During the first and most difficult year after Wyatt's diagnosis, I wrote an email to close family and friends, letting them know what was going on and the challenges our family was facing and why we dropped out of sight. I was amazed at the outpouring of love and affection and all the help I received from that email. First, you have to be vulnerable. You can't be afraid to ask. Try this out. Could you cook me a meal? Are you going to the market? Can you pick me up a few things? Could your kids play with my kid and make them feel included? Or can you come over and clean my house? Well, maybe not that last one except with your best friend. And maybe the best support of all is having someone that listens, and that doesn't cost a dime. So until next time, surround yourself with the loving kindness of others and keep the faith. It's always fun, because whenever someone asks, I run away in fear. We're Asperger's or us. It's true, we're the first comedy troupe composed of people on the autism spectrum. So if we're not funny, blame it on Ethan's disability. <laughs> you should come to what might be our last ever show. We'll be able to do material that we've worked on but haven't performed yet, and also, it'll be really, really silly. Sell out Earth. This is definitely the most challenging show we've had. We want aliens to come to the show and be turned away because it's full. There's parts that are screwed up, there's parts the audience doesn't get, but we're realistic. So if the aliens get in, that's okay too. It's gonna be a disaster. It's going Don't to be. Don't start thinking this way. I was born this way. <laughs> I've been more stress than I have been in the past. We're hypersensitive because something's irritating us from the inside. I'm saying that I feel upset. All of this stuff that's hard, that's difficult for us, this is what we get for starting Asperger's R Us. I asked. I'm not, I'm not talking about you. I want you guys to leave. I just want it to be done now. It's a lonely, lonely world. This is my diagnosis, the actual time I got diagnosed on the autism spectrum, and I skipped home because I felt freer than I ever had. It explained everything that had ever happened to me that didn't make sense. When you have Asperger's, you can do things that are really, really great, not in spite of having autism, but through it. You're doing really good, dude. I'm really happy that we're in this troop together. And the rabbi interrupts him and says, sorry to cut you off. <laughs> These guys are my best friends. I don't really have anything bad to say. <laughs> This gazebo has the stupidest sign, because what the hell else are you gonna do in a gazebo? I'm a rebel without a cause, baby. A lot of adults don't really believe kids. They'll think, ah, oh, kids are kids, what are they talking about? But when a child stands up for what they believe in, 
It's so strong and powerful. I first got involved with autism advocacy four years ago when my friend was diagnosed. When I found out about my friend's diagnosis, I didn't really understand what it meant. But it didn't matter to me or change our friendship. I didn't look at her any differently. We still had so much fun together. Now I know that she experiences life a little differently than me, and that's okay. Knowing what she goes through has helped me to understand and be more caring towards other people in similar situations. I got involved with ACT Today because I wanted to do whatever I could to help. They provide options like behavioral therapy, medical care, social skills programs, assistance to military families, and much more. Being there for my friend was my number one priority. I've been volunteering and spreading the word about the cause via my social media platform because raising awareness is a crucial first step. There needs to be more kids and teens involved to make sure that our voices are heard just as loudly as the adults. You may be small like me, but your acts of kindness are not. Potty training is different for every child. A child could come in with absolutely you know, no control over their bladder, and as long as that's not a medical issue, then we can certainly approach it behaviorally and give them the tools they need to be successful, you know, just like any other skill that we would teach. Well, we think he's learning to pee on the potty. No big successes yet and lots and lots of accidents. Here is the laundry from today. For some of our kids it takes, you know, just a couple days. And then for other kids, it can take months and months and months. And then when you're looking at complete independence, it can take years. Hey, you have to go pee pee? There's a lot of different ways to tell if a child is ready. We look for a couple different things. Um, probably the most important is parents saying, I need this to happen, I'm ready. Second is you know, a child showing interest in the bathroom, and some of it is simply age. It's time to go ahead and, and work on this. What are you doing? I'm peeing. You're pooping? you first start with teaching the child what they need to do on the toilet. The basic thing we want is for them to drink as much liquid as possible. It's inevitable that if you drink a bunch of liquid, you're gonna pee. Help! No, you, no I can't help you pee. Help. I can hold your hand, but I can't help you pee. Ultimately, what we want is that, you know, the child, as soon as they're put on the toilet, they urinate. So that's step one. Step two is usually um, working through the amount of time that they're off of the toilet and making sure that they're not having accidents during the time that they're off. So this is kind of the bladder control stage of things. So the purpose of the potty log is just to see how long it takes them as soon as they sit on the potty for them to actually urinate and the amount of time that um, he's able to hold his urine. And with the log, we're able to visually see how long it takes them each time, if they have the accidents or not. He's on a half hour potty schedule, so if he doesn't go when we take him, then we have to take him in 10 more minutes. So every 10 minute intervals until he does go, and then we reset the clock and it's 30 minutes again. Okay, buddy, okay, last chance, last chance to go pee-pees. Did we reset it for 10? What we hope happens in this time is that the kids will learn how to initiate going to the bathroom on their own. This is oftentimes the hardest part of potty training is because they get so used to somebody telling them when they need to go that they're not really recognizing the signs just in their own body of when they need to go. Oh, he wet himself. Uh-oh. Oh. Big wet? Was it a lot? <laughs> we can reset to half an hour now. The biggest thing for parents is not to give up. The other big tip, and I think pitfall that a lot of parents fall into, is putting their children back into pull-ups or diapers, especially if they're starting to have accidents. And this is probably the worst thing that you can do. They need to recognize that feeling of fullness in their bladder and take themselves to the bathroom or tell an adult that they need to go to the bathroom. What do you have to do? You have to put your pee pee in the potty. Okay, give it a shot. See if you guys put it in there. There you go. There you go. You're doing it. Yay. Great job. Hey, great for your pee pee. Big Yay. number of pee pee. <laughs>
Welcome back. What an exciting moment that always is when they have that first successful, as they say, evacuation into the bath, uh, the bathroom, into the toilet. Uh, hey, I promised you Lamar Hardwick, and I'm heartbroken because for some reason our Skype is not connecting. Lamar, if you're watching, please check your email because I, I emailed you in an alternate way to... Ah, he's talking to her right now, so we've, we're getting through to him. So, And while they're working that out, I just want to say a little bit about potty training. We had somebody who write, wrote in to ask Dr. Doreen yesterday, um, talking about 10 years old and still struggling with potty issues. And it was one of the, it was a heartbreaking um, thing to hear about because, uh, and, and Dr. Doreen Grampichet gave him, a, a, the dad who wrote in a lot of information about things to be looking into, that there might be other things going on. And I, and I was particularly struck by the fact because, and I keep dancing around something, let me say this, that when we talk to the people who are trained and do quality ABA, the one thing that they tell us over and over and over again is that potty training is possible with all kids. That, you know, the people who do this and do this on a regular basis uh, will tell you that sometimes it takes longer for some uh, individuals, but that it's they totally have cracked the code on potty training and they're able to do that. I know that there is fear. I had fear, oh my goodness. Uh, when my son was diagnosed and people were saying to me things like, oh, you know, it's, hey, autism is not such a bad thing. I, you know, I, I know somebody who's, fifth, this real conversation, somebody said to me, I know, I have a friend who's 15 years old and he's on the autism spectrum and he's doing great. And I was like, really? Tell me about him. What is he like at 15? And she's like, well, he's still in diapers, but he's doing great and I like wanted to jump off a bridge. I was like, that's our definition of great, 15 and, and still in diapers. And, and look, there are individuals who are 15 and still in diapers and maybe we haven't prioritized or we haven't revisited it because the potty training didn't go well when it should have gone. But let me say this on the show, if you have a 15 year old who is in diapers, you do not have to be. It might take, it might take longer right? Because there's been some training that wasn't effective. And so it might take until your child is 18. But what else are we doing? What's more important than that? There is, we really need to prioritize the potty training and having really good people help us because it's hard to do by yourself. It really, really is. But the good people know how to do this and they know how to do this with all kinds of individuals. They've had the opportunity to do this with children who are two, who are three, who are five, who are seven, who are 11, who are 16, who are 22, who are 35. I had uh, a therapist sit and tell me about how they went through potty training for somebody who was 45 years old and ha was twice exceptional autism and had other um, comorbid issues, an intellectual disability, and they were able to get him potty trained. So please, I, I heard Sienna say in the, in the video, don't give up. Uh, none of us want to give up. And um, it can be done. It absolutely can be done. And if you have a child who is uh, young and in the window of when potty training normally happens and you're thinking, yeah, but my child has autism, it's not going to be possible. I'm here to tell you it's infinitely possible. As I said, they have cracked the code. Samantha, talk to me. Are we, are we going back to Lamar? We want to take a short break. I don't know what we're coming back to, but stick with us. It's going to be exciting. We are here at the Los Angeles Zoo. We've got quite a group here. I've got my son, Jem, Mike from the A-Word, and Jack Riley, star of the A-Word, and Jessica. We've got a whole crew of people, and we're gonna take a tour around the LA Zoo and see some exciting animals. Sound good, you guys? Yeah. What are the safety rules, though? Who do you have to stay next to? Daddy and D Dad. So remember what we talked about, that every time you do something good, I'm going to write it on my hand. When you get 35 of these, what are you going to get? Three hours of enhancement. Yes, it's not a secret. You can tell people. What kinds of things do you need to do to get a mark on my hand? Being kind. And good listening. Jem, can you show them where the, where the um, chimpanzee is? Can you point it out to him? Show Jack Riley. Tell 
tell us what your responsibilities are here at the LA Zoo. I am the manager of volunteer programs at the Greater Los Angeles Zoo Association. I, I oversee the docents, the student volunteers, the general volunteers, and community service volunteers. Give us an overview of what kinds of things people can see at the zoo. There are lots of lots of animals to see. We have a lot of endangered. We are participating in a lot of conservation programs, and we offer a lot of education programs for our community, for uh, school groups, for members, uh, special needs. What kinds of accommodations can you make when somebody has specific issues? Uh, we have our special needs outreach program, and where we have a van that goes out into the community, and we bring a handful of animals to facilities that can't quite get to the zoo. So that could be a school, that could be a retirement community, that could be a hospital, uh, and there are some court courthouses that we visit as well. And we bring a couple animals and we talk about them and it's kind of a fun experience. Um, so that's our outreach program. And then on grounds, we also have uh, tours and we offer special needs tours for people catered to their needs. We have our petting zoo, so you can go and you can pet some goats. We're here with From Autism Live and we were wondering if you could tell us what it's like to be a goat in the zoo. Really? And then we have our condor rescue zone, so you can go in and pretend you are a condor or you could be a biologist or you could be a vet and it's kind of fun. Thank you for all the work that you do here for, and for making it accessible for all of our kids. with Janet Jackson. Janet, tell us what your role at the zoo is. My role is a docent and we're volunteers. How did you learn all the things that you know? Well, that's the great thing about the Los Angeles Zoo. We have a special docent program. It's one of the most stringent ones in the in the country. Actually, it's UCLA accredited class. Well, it added so much to our visit to the zoo today. So I thank you for all your knowledge and, and all your giving to the community. Well, thank you because I had a special needs child too. And I think it's so important that they interact with animals and that helped my son when he was going through so much trauma that we saw that he was able to um, to grow and to expand a little bit and it just helped us as parents because we had a tool to use and we saw the love and the, and 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 the care that he was able to bring out just by touching animals and being around animals because there is no judgment there amen to that well thank you for paying it forward because you are I definitely saw you doing that today. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you for being here. What was hard for you guys today at the zoo, do you feel? Um, to be completely honest, I was about to say um, this is the easiest, best outing I can recall. My concerns are... Uh, I think we're sort of past elopement, but it's, uh, it's always on my mind when it's just with the two of us out in a, you know, you can get 20 feet away if it's busy and be lost, you know, uh, be, be misplaced. But nothing like that happened today. Um, there were a lot of people helping me, of course. It was interesting for me because Jem hasn't been here since he was three, like right after we started therapy, and I remember that was hellish, the day that we were here. Sometimes I don't notice the progress until we're out someplace like this. Do you feel like that's true too? Yes. Today I was actually comfortable with him being 15, 20 feet away, and even if he wasn't holding uh, just anybody's hand or anything, I was comfortable, and that's, uh, that, that's a new feeling. <laughs> I, I watched that and I said, man, there's no way we could have done that at that age. So he's doing really well. And I was so engaged by how Jack Riley is so aware of the circumstances around him. He's really doing great. Yeah, he, thank you. He's curious. He's, um, and he's just learned a lot. I mean, I, and I can't give enough credit to uh, Miss Jessica. Um, no disrespect to any of our other therapists, and she's been with him for the whole time. So that's a constant in his life, and uh, I dread the day when she's not. <laughs> it's always amazing. I, you know, we had our rock star on our team. There's always one therapist that just becomes a part of your family forever. What would you say to parents who are afraid to do it even with an aide? Um, I understand your fear, because um, I've always had it. Um, but sometimes they surprise you. Uh, I know it's called a spectrum for a reason, and my son is not like any other son or daughter, and so I can't advise you on what may or may not happen. Uh, we were always worried about transitions. They're getting better because we do it, and explain what is expected before you get here. That's a one, uh, That was a hard lesson for me to learn, but every time I don't explain them the, to him the expectations, um, I have more problems. I have more transitional issues. But when he knows what 
transitions or he's going to face that day, he handles it. So my advice would be talk it out, but come do it and, and uh, come again, even if it's a horrible experience, because it might be. You got to do it the first time before you can do it the second time. So I think in general, I mean, you know, I explained the expectations here and we carried it out of my hand. I agree with you. It's super duper important. I think it's good for us, too, because then we know what we're expecting, too. And they've we engaged each other a little bit, which I was very uh, happy to see. Thank you so much for coming and doing this play date with us. We had a really great time. Well, thank you for having me. I enjoyed it, and uh, it was just a great experience. I can't wait to tell my wife how well he did. So, And let's do it again sometime. Okay, anytime. Okay. Oh, man, we love the L.A. Zoo, and I want to talk about that in just a second. But just to update you what's going on, we're having some sort of technical difficulty, and we cannot connect with Lamar Hardwick. He, uh, we're, we're giving it up because we got our next guest here. But Lamar has so graciously agreed to revisit this. We're going to do this next week with Lamar. So he will be on the show next week. Um, and in just a minute, we're going to be joined in the studio by Carrie Bowers, and she's bringing her friend Brian, who is one of the people who's on the All Autism panel that's happening on February 2nd. It's being done by the Art of Autism, and they're going to talk with us specifically about that. I still don't know Brian's last name, but Brian's going to tell me when he gets in here. So that's what we're going to do. But just briefly before that, I just want to say about this LA Zoo, uh, we were talking about Instagramming a moment. You know, I think uh, there were a lot of years when we started doing the show here at Autism Live and my son was a particular age. Before that I was, you know, Little Miss videographer and I videographed every moment uh, that he was breathing and I was taking pictures and whatever and I kind of got busy with this show and thank goodness that we had other people following us around with cameras because I, oh, to see him in those little boy moments you just don't realize. Um, please, please, please videotape as much as you can and don't just videotape the good moments. Definitely there is a benefit to videotaping when your child is tantruming because later on when your child's doing really well and you're telling people this is how things used to be, they're not going to believe you and then you want to have the videotape to show them. I guarantee you it'll be it'll come in useful. All right, we're going to take a break because we got to get Carrie and Brian into the studio. Stick with us. Back in a few. Nick was diagnosed with autism in 1994 at the age of four. He received five years of therapy from CARD that eventually faded out. Nick recovered from autism in 2001. This song I'm about to perform is by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. CARD helped many patients, myself, to recover to this level now. Cheryl and Mike's son, Jack Riley, was diagnosed with autism in 2010 at age two. He's been receiving therapy from CARD for a year and a half. Today, Cheryl, Mike, and Nick meet for the first time. I'm curious as to what you remember. I certainly remember pretty long sessions, and I'd be frustrated if I would make mistakes. I mean, I remember one time I had to count a row of six blocks, kept messing up. That was really difficult. No. I need it. I need it. At what point do you recall hearing the word autism? I was able to figure out what I was going through without anybody having to tell me. Our concern is if it's a big secret to hide. I don't know what, what we can no say. No one ever told you, you just, you just yeah. discerned But the it. reason I'm comfortable talking about this is because I felt it. In therapy, I began, I certainly began questioning why you know, people reacted as they did based on what I said and did. Particularly because of difficulties I was facing in school, I just, it got to a point where I wanted to understand why it was. So I entered while still um, going through therapy and still showing significant signs of the mental condition. Even after I'd improved to a significant extent, there were those who still gave me a hard time for it. Did it hurt your feelings when you were in school, the way it that did. kids... Oh, absolutely, because it was bullying, it was harassment. That scares us. That, they called me names, they, I was basically, when it came to sports and PE, I was usually the last kid chosen. Did yeah. teachers intervene? Um, fortunately, not really. I mean, it was just so hard for me to talk about it because 
how ashamed I felt. You know, certainly the first few years of elementary school, I don't think I really had the most supportive teachers. I mean, I remember I, my mom told me how my first grade teacher once said that she thought I had no chance of getting anywhere and going away to college and out of state and being the only person um, for my old school district has made a difference. It's just really improved my you social life tremendously you, because I got to be me because with nobody knowing about my past, I wasn't faced with these um, misconceptions and prejudgments. Do you tell people, new people that you meet? At no, that's not the first thing I will ever No, I would hope it's not the first and thing. And you know what? In most cases, I never do because while it's a part of my past, it doesn't define who I am. I mean, just thinking back, just thinking back to the very beginning, pretty much each episode, autism, what, not who. I want to tell you right now, though, uh, I'm so impressed with you. Likewise. I want you to know that. Likewise. I mean, um, your, your son really inspires me just good, as much because good, good, good. I'll tell you any time. I, I adore him, and, yeah. and, and but uh, I'd be lying if I, I, I said it wasn't challenging. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, it's, it's, it's cost me my, 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 the stuff that, uh, you know, like career things, mm -hmm. goals, I don't care about those anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I work at night, I'm tending bar. Mm -hmm. um, not that I'm too good for that, I'm just saying that's what I do. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I want him to have a chance. Right. And uh, you, you inspire me now. Thank you. If the feeling goes both ways. If the feeling's mutual. Before you leave today, we would Hi. like you to meet Jack. I would love to. This is Nick. Hi, Nick. Hey, Jack Riley. All right, should we try this? I'm going to try to take a picture of all of you. One, two, and three. Yet I never saw you before. I beat your head. As a celebrity, whatever that means, you want to do what you can to get back. The way I've always looked at it, if I'm available, I'm going to be there. And when you get there and you see what folks are doing and the lives that they're touching, how can you not want to continue to be a part of it? And for the first time, I am looking. What can we all do to make a difference? Not only with trying to find the cure, but to help the children and the families that may not have the resources for these kids. When you're looking back at me, now I understand what... And none of us are doing that, but I think that we're doing as much as we possibly can. Because we all live in society, and the more we can all do to help society, the more it helps all of us. Yeah. And for the first time, Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm so excited because we have two wonderful guests in the studio with us to finish out the show. We have Carrie Bowers from The Art of Autism, who's been with us before, and we love her. And Carrie has brought a friend, Brian Dunn, with her. We talked about this a little bit earlier in the show, that you guys are getting ready to do a pretty big event on the 2nd, February 2nd. Tell us a little bit, what is the event that's happening, Brian? It's an autistic panel where... Um it's going to be live streamed over the internet, and it's regarding people that have autism and how they um, how they cope with it and deal with it, and the challenges that they face, and um, pretty much that's basically it. 
Well, it sounds very exciting, um, and I love this idea of the entire panel being individuals who are on the autism spectrum. You yourself identify as somebody who's on the autism spectrum. Yes, I am. Um, and, and how old are you, Brian? I'm 38 years old. And, you know, and it occurs to me that probably that might not be a question that everybody loves. Is it okay to ask you how old you are? Yes, I'm fine with that. You I, know, if you asked I don't me, I would be like, Brian. Yes, that, that, well, <laughs> well, well, that's not really a question a, ma a man asks a woman, so. Well, but maybe, you know, I need to be more sensitive to that. Maybe some men don't want to be asked that. But I'm, that, I'm, that's true. I've all, that's true. Uh, so I apologize for having asked that. But, you know, part of why I wanted to ask that is I think so often, even on this show, we try really hard to showcase adults who are on the autism spectrum. Because um, a lot of the conversation, because insurance drives a lot of things, ends up being about kids on the spectrum. So that's why this panel, I think, is really exciting. So many adults on the autism spectrum, and it's an opportunity for those of us who have younger kids to come and hear what it's like for you and to learn from you and from the other people on the panel. So happening on February 2nd, where is it happening, Brian? At the, at the, um... And I, I, I'm sorry about that. I'm a little nervous. No, that's okay. That's okay. So I'm, I'm a little nervous. Sorry about that. Oh, um, why? You're doing so great. Um, th 30345 Canwood at the Chabad, the Chabad in Agora. Chabad. Chabad in Agora. The event will be live streamed on YouTube. Fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous. And so how did this, first of all, how did the two of you come about? When did you first meet Carrie Bowers? I met Carrie Bowers in mid of mid of 2016, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And um, I, we just connected. We just, um, I went to um, an autism um, act event. And when I got there, there was just something that really clicked with me. It was just something that was just magical about it. I, I think liked it a, lot. a lot of people find Carrie Bowers a little bit magical because she's got that quality about her. She but does. as I, I, I think I've heard that this was an Art of Autism event. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Do you notice that I'm really keeping my mouth shut? You're doing so good. Because this so is good. Brian's moment <laughs> to really share and our panel's time. So I'm going to learn how to shut my mouth, but there are some details I'd like to fill in as we need them today. Absolutely. We warned Brian ahead of time that he was sitting with two women who are, like to talk a lot. We we're both very comfortable and that it's you know a, a tough thing for anybody, mm -hmm. but I appreciate that this is a mission that you're on to do more listening than speaking because I need to be on that mission as well. But fill in the details for well, us, Carrie. Well, let's go back to in August. We were okay. screening Normal People Scare Me Too yes. at the old silent movie theater in Fairfax, old Charlie Chaplin, beautiful venue. Yeah. And we had the Art of Autism art all in the back patio with Bogan Villa. I mean, it was gorgeous. Oh, yeah. And Brian walked in with his parents. And I want you to take it from here. Besides the magic, what did you say to yourself that you later told me when you saw that? Is it possible I could display my artwork here? Because I'd really like to show people my artwork and see what they think about it. Wow. Yeah. That's a powerful moment. Yes, yeah, very powerful. And something else happened there. Your parents stood on the sidelines with their mouths open, <laughs> yeah. saying, who is this son of ours? Yeah. Because what were you doing in that environment? I was going around asking people questions about, I was introducing myself to them. By the way, um, I gave I gave Brian a challenge because I was being inundated with people, yeah. and yet we were meant to meet that day on purpose. Right. And so I didn't want him to be sort of on the sidelines just kind of watching. So I gave him a challenge, okay. which we can do with any of our kids. This right. comes from my social skill facilitation past. And I asked you, I want you to go find six people. Mm -hmm. I want you to learn their name and what brought them here today. That's exactly what I did. Do you so well? <laughs> and when you came back to me, do you remember how how close you were to perfect in your your demonstration of that activity? Do you remember? Almost there. Uh, scale scale from one to ten. Almost there. Five yeah. people's names. Five people's wow. names. And why four of them came? Wow, that's amazing. And, yes. And so, what happened after that event? What did we begin to do? We began to get to know each other a lot better, and we got to. Um, well, I'm kind of nervous right now, but it's. It's I okay. Guess you know what? We go blah when we're nervous. <laughs> yeah. Um, we began to work together. We get. We had exactly. So Brian and I work together once a week for a couple of hours, uh -huh. and we work on um, executive, administrative, life skill um, functioning, 
And do I push you hard? Yes, you do. You push me hard, but yeah. you really you really love me and care about me, and that's why you do it. Well, and, and I realize that. And share a little bit, and I know Meg, your mom, won't mind. Before we began to work with each other, yes. how did you um, consider your mom in your life? As I, wonderful as she is. As wonderful as my mom is, I kind of consider her to be kind of a vulture on my back. So helicopter mom, yeah. a little bit too overprotective, so she's hovering over me and... You know, that just, that's basically how I saw my mom back then. And I think a lot of individuals feel that way about, mm -hmm. I would say that my, if my son were sitting here, he would be nodding his head, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm, I can sometimes, I'm so, I, I want to, you know, before we started, I said, I, I have to know where my phone is right. in case my son has to get a hold of me. I'll I, go on record saying my son's not talking to me right now. Yeah. He's doing what a lot of, um, sons or daughters do at 16, 18, rebelling against authority and their parents. Yeah. And um, my um, very dear friend um, wrote me a letter and said, thank goodness you gave him the tools that he could reach into that and rebel. And I want to say too, Carrie, I just want to thank you because you have been very transparent about your journey in so many different ways. And I had seen you post something about you know this very topic and um, and I I don't think that I publicly thank you so let me do that here because it really gives all of us an opportunity to learn to prepare to not judge ourselves to not feel because I clearly look at you and think you're an amazing mom and if there's a moment when your son says I need to separate and not talk to you I see that as a moment of strength for you to say it's okay and for him to say I'm going to be my own person and come back to you I wouldn't have seen that for myself but when that happens with my son I will have your experience to say hey you know, I'm just going to take a breath here because this is what happens Carrie showed me that so thank you well, and thank you. And I want to make it clear, I'm not posting about it wantonly. No. I've posted like twice. And one of them was Christmas Eve or 11 o'clock at night. Christmas Eve is his birthday. And it was the first birthday in 28 years I was not with him. And I, I suddenly, I felt like I couldn't breathe. Yeah. So what I did was I said, I, I, I don't think I can breathe or something like that. And I hit the send button, not really realizing that I hit the enter button. And I mean, I have people, because I don't usually, yeah. it's not that I'm not transparent, but I do feel that we need to be vulnerable as advocates, as speakers, as yes. moms. Yeah. And I mean, I had people immediately emailing me, calling me, um, texting me, saying, do we need to call 911? Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, I'm just crying, and I don't cry easy. Yeah. So when I see your mom, who I also work with individually, because she yes. is open, she is vulnerable, and I would like to get back to now, though I held you, I, I, I asked you, all right, so mom's the vulture on your back, but what are you doing in your life to be the adult she's nagging you to be? And at the time, way back when we first started working yes. together, how much of your life were you driving, the not the real vehicle, but the metaphoric <laughs> vehicle of your yes. life? How much were you doing for yourself? I was doing pretty, pretty much most of it. Before we started working? Um, no, at, toward... Um, when we started working. When we started working, yes. um, the truth is you were pretty much on your couch playing video games. Yes. And you weren't doing very well in the class that, class that you had. No, I wasn't week. taking it very seriously at all. I was kind of once, slacking off. I think it's fair to say that once, Brian, you began to find your own power. Yes. Your own self-determination. And it began to matter to you, not because of mom, not because of dad or your brother. Mm -hmm. Um, I have seen you take on challenges like being here today yeah. Um, yeah. in a huge way. So talk about that. Talk about like the class that you're taking, for example. I'm taking a dental technology class in Simi Valley. Yay. Uh, yep. I'm enjoying it a lot more than I was previously. I've taken it more seriously now. It's more of an interactive thing because I socialize and mingle with the people in the class and joke around with them, whereas before I just kept to myself and really didn't say anything to anyone but now it's something that I look, really look forward to because I'm like one of the guys now yeah when I go there and so are you working towards the, the, the hope of being a dental hygienist or a dental technician what's what's the end game what do you want to do after the, when you get all done with your schooling 
afterwards I'd like to become a dental technician. Okay. And I really think that'd really be good for me. I can see that. I would come to the dentist office where I would trust you with my teeth. Mm -hmm. I, I would absolutely do that, Brian. Uh, so you'll have to keep us informed when you're ready and, okay. and when that's all happening. It's a pretty powerful thing. And I know that there are people who are watching who, you know, have been saying for a while, you know, there aren't enough things for teenagers. There aren't enough things for young adults. There aren't enough... You know, so you're doing this very exciting work with both with Brian and with his mom. If people want to participate in that and want to know more about it, Carrie, where do they go? Well, here's what I want to, um, we've, Brian and I've talked about it, because I think that you will be fabulous with people. I think it's so, too. I think that, um, like, my son's support staff is a young man, same age, with autism. Mm. I can see you mentoring other people with autism and this panel that's happening yeah. next week um, is a way to begin engage from the person first perspective your values your dreams your hopes what's easy for you what's hard for you so I'm thinking that how people could access this is I would like to see Brian and um, maybe other people through the art of autism begin to do like a once a month um, Kind of a forum like this, yeah, and where we take we take questions from audience, yeah, and it's autism to autism with supports, yeah, and that's how we're building that. The Art of Autism is doing seven tutorial films this year, wonderful on how to brand, market, etc. So that's a lot about the work functioning. Right, I see this as being a forum where it can be autism to autism sharing ideas. Yeah. And so I see you leading that kind of a forum with other people. And so not yet, but people will be able to access kind of the values and the core work of what we do as Amazing. we build it this year. So we're starting with this event on February 2nd, and it's happening at the Chabad. And where, where should people go? Should they go to the Art of Autism Facebook page to get more information? Yes, they can go to the Art of Autism Facebook page. Where we've got a couple of things up, but the blog will be officially put out tomorrow. Okay. Um, can I tell a little bit about the people who are going to be on the Please, panel? Why absolutely. don't you help share their names, um, and we'll go one by one, and, and I'll... I'll share a little bit because right now is a learning opportunity for us so that yeah, he can be more absolutely. conversational about his fellow panel members. Yes. The six pa panel members will include myself. Um, my name is Brian Dunn. Yes. I'm a nice, quiet, good natured person. And um, it will also include number two, Alex Genera G Generous. Generous. Carrie can, uh, all right, and, and, and number three, Dan Rosian, four, Ikea Wilson, five, Steve Andrews, and six, Louis Tirado. So Alex Generous is a early 20s young gal who won a science national science competition when she was 19. Wow. She's gone on to do one TED Talk and two TEDx Talks. Wow. She is a writer, she is an artist, and she is an advocate, and she is a dynamic woman, and I'm really excited about that because we have two women panel members, and we need more voices yes. of the first-person perspective in Absolutely. women's issues yes. in disabilities. Yes. Um, so we're excited to have her. We're really lucky to have her. Dan Rosian, this is exciting. Um, he will be using augmented communication to answer his questions because he does not use, fun you know, I hate the word functional conversation, but it is not um, conversation as we might do right here. He's not using vocal speech. Right. Thank you. Um, so there, I, I never know how to be political. Well, correct. I know. I mean, there's all these words and they mean different things. And, and people talk about being nonverbal. And, and so I always say, you know, there's no not vocal speech. And so, you know, and then somebody will tell me if that's wrong. Who knows? But how wonderful. But I have heard that you would like questions sent yes. in early. We've gotten three questions. We have room okay. for about three more. Okay. So, yes, questions early from around the country. We're looking forward to that. All right. Um, and so, for example, all the panel members have received the questions in advance. Love so that. Dan is able to take his time. He's an 11th grader, by the way. And wow. so that's that's exciting. Uh, we have Luis Tirado, who's also um, a teenager. Yes. He used to live here. He's coming in from Boston.
Austin to be oh. on the panel. I've met him, and a lovely young man, brilliant artist. Fabulous artist, yeah. um, um, going into music, actually. He's at the really? Boston, I think it's the Boston Conservatory now. Well, hello. Um, he is somebody I've known for years and just adore him, and he's, you know, he's going to have definitely some good things to share with the, with yeah. the audience and so forth. Um, we've got Ikea Wilson, who is, um, again, an artist. A lot of these people tend to be in the arts. The arts, though, often help individuals on the spectrum to create and to launch and to share their voice. Yes. So I tend to attract people who love music, drama, dance, you know, painting. So a lot of them have the interest in the arts, but they also have a passion for advocacy. It's the magic in you that attracts that. We're almost out of time, so I do want to point out that if people are attending live, and they can, that there's a $10 um, ticket fee, but that all of that money, my understanding, goes to the people on the panel, all of it. Yeah, let me clarify. Okay. It's $10 a ticket at the door. Okay. Live streaming is free. Right. Anybody who watches it through streaming through the YouTube channel, which we'll put that up and get that going on. Do so, we know what the address is for the YouTube channel yet? You know, I have to say no. Um, we're okay. doing, we're we'll literally let, doing we'll it as we speak Thursday. today. Okay. Um, we'll but people, people can check in with the Art of Autism. They can look me up um, okay, on Facebook, great. what have you. And that is free on YouTube. Yes. And 100% of that $10 that people have been buying. Oh, Eventbrite. Um, we are on Eventbrite okay. currently. All right. And so um, that will continue to update. Maybe at the end the... of this program, you can tag the event. Bright in that We're way. like literally 30 seconds left. That's so. what I said. Never mind. <laughs> So, uh, but we'll tell them next week. Excellent. All right. Excellent. Um, but in any case, you know, if you are here locally and want to go $10 and it goes to the panel, I love that. Uh, but we will update you next week on what, how to, how to watch the live stream, which is free. We're totally out of time. Uh, we will be back next Wednesday, but thank you guys so much for being here. And I wish you the most wonderful luck. You did great. Thank for you. For your second interview. This is amazing. Truly wonderful. All right, you guys, uh, until next week, give your kiddos a hug for me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.